it's actually an incredibly dark thought where he purges himself through mass murder and killing the quote unquote bad guys. He purges himself in a blood ritual and he comes out of it a more whole centered and at peace human being. It's <laughs> what he needed. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> All right, everybody. It's time for one fucking hour. I am Evan Husney, uh, joined, of course, by my dudes here. To my left, we got Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, what's up? Hey, I'm back home, for better or worse. Uh, <laughs> and uh, all things are in order now at one fucking hour. We've settled into our three places, you know. Well, not me. I mean, I am... Uh... Oh, wait, no, you're a variable again. <laughs> yeah. Holy Christ, we are a moving target. Yep. Okay, right. All right. Yep. Well, yeah, here we it's go. It's the summer. I'm coming to you live from upstate New York right now. Um, but uh, back in his uh, usual wooden crate, we have to my right, uh, Mr. Marcus Herring. What's going on? Back in the crate. You know, one of these days, I'm going to figure out a good catchphrase for the beginning of the show. Whenever you start to introduce us, I go, oh, my brain goes, oh, God, I didn't think of something to say. <laughs> How about this? Naganooch. Oh. <laughs> Naganooch. I don't no one would ever. His- no one reference. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. It's uh, Jay of Jay and Silent Bob. Oh, no, that's uh, that's like Snoochie Boochies. Yeah. Naganooch. Oh. Yeah. Just throwing it out I think there. it's Snoochie Boochies. Oh, my God. I think it's the, both. The poor... You know why, you know, wait, wait, hold on. You know why I know that? My friend worked at, like, Google in, like, 20 years ago, and he uh, got swag at a Google party, and one of them was Jay Doll. <laughs> Listen to me. It was a Jay Doll... And it and we would just we were stoned out of our minds, and we just you just press the back of his butt, you know, the button in the back of him, and he would just go like, "Nah, dude," and I was like, so I know for a fact that at some point that asshole said, "Nah, dude." Okay, all right. Because uh, oh wait, I'm not talking. I'm not done talking about Jay yet. He's my first LA celebrity sighting. You know, maybe oh. circa 2001 Nooch? or something. 2000 Nooch? Um, Nooch. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning at a gas station on uh, La Cienega. Jesus (laughs) Christ. All right. Apologies, uh, God, for all the new listeners who are going to click on our one fucking hour review of Taxi Driver and then hear uh, us nooching off in the first uh, couple of seconds. Jay and Silent Bob. Jesus Hey, welcome to one fucking hour, man. You know, (laughs) that's how the ball ball crumbles. It is shameful. It is shameful. All right. Yeah. From from one dorm room movie to the next. All right. Here we go. Um, (laughs) This week on One Fucking Hour, we are doing episode 35, guys. A little minor milestone. Uh, It's going to be one fucking hour on Martin Skezzy's um, Taxi Driver. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm all fired up about this. The coin toss from last week determined our fate. We was either going to be King of Comedy or Taxi Driver, and it's, it, it uh, determined our death style essentially. <laughs> <laughs> the coin toss, to so I've speak. Been, sorry, I've been listening to Saint Anger way more than wow. I should be. I'm sorry, that's I, really. That's heavy. You should see there. Yeah, you should see Doctor Phil about that. The other, I mean, you know, Cosby sweater, Doctor Phil. Okay. Anyway, when you right. sent me that song, it was called. I was like, it's called Sweet Amber. Yes, it's called on the album Saint Anger. Yeah, I know. Does everything rhyme on that record, or no? What is that? I right. my theory is that um, the even dumber people started uh, getting into the lyrics, the songwriting. <laughs> so it's even dumber than usual. Just my thought, my two cents, well, not being. A, oh, that's we see that in the movie, right? Yeah, yes. right. That's yeah. and then yeah. that's where you got, you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. shout out to. Uh, yeah, that was a little shout out to our episode from a few weeks. Oh, was that last week? Uh, yeah. Yeah, last week's last episode, week. one fucking hour in Saint Anger. So, Herb Saint Anger. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> we should do one fucking All right, let's, hour. Let's start again. <laughs> uh, yeah, an, I want to just bring up that Evan suggested that we do another hour on some kind of monster <laughs> this he week. Did. Don't I, don't put him on Front Street. I'm um, I'm totally okay I, with that. Like, well, it'd be just the outtakes. 
Yes. Know? Oh, they're so good, good. By the way. Okay. Um, maybe someday. You know what? Maybe oh. maybe a Patreon campaign oh, or something. That sounds good. That sounds good. A special bonus. I'm not averse to that. Ooh, I like that. You know, um, hey, my lifestyle. You know. Yeah. You know what? Uh, best style here. <clears throat> All right. You, you wash my back. You know, we do a second episode <laughs> of, the, of some uh, kind of more monster. Metallica lyrics. Oh my god. All right. Anyway, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, you guys fucking ready for this? Uh, okay, yeah. one fucking hour on Taxi Driver. I'm going to start that clock officially. <laughs> Let's get out of this world and into the next. I'm laughing tick, already. Tick, tock. <laughs> <laughs> all right, friend, tick, 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 tock. Here we go. All right. Um, all right, quick, I'm quick, not going <laughs> to... Normally on this show, we obviously read a little synopsis, fill you guys in on the movie. This week, there's no need to do that. Everybody knows Taxi Driver. Um, and I have to be honest, when the, when the coin flip, uh, from uh, the end of last week's episode picked taxi driver, I was kind of like, mm-hmm. Oh shit. Like, do I have stuff to say about this movie that hasn't been said already? Um, mm-hmm. and that kind of freaked me out a little bit to be honest when we committed to it, but I did obviously watch the movie again for the millionth time, uh, before going into this. And yeah, there's a lot of, you know, shit on the floor there to, to sort of examine that, you know, I don't think a lot of people, uh, you know, sort of zero in on with this movie because a lot of classic moments and classic scenes that are overshadowed by pop culture and blah 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 um so anyway yeah there's a lot we could do like 10 minutes on albert brooks for instance oh not a lot lot of people do that no for instance exactly yeah so i'm sure we'll be getting into things like that yeah well we will do that but just of course but now with the clock running tom i know you have a you have a fun anecdote about how you first heard about this movie take (laughs) us take us back to your initial exposure with uh taxi driver yeah. Well, uh, my grandfather was a real character, a uh, very cool guy, Pete. And um, just to give you some color on him, um, he is Lithuanian. And so he idolized um, Charles Bronson because he's Lithuanian. And they right. actually look, it, it looks somewhat similar. And uh, he was like, you know, he's one of us. He's our hero. And he loved Death Wish. And he lived in Chicago and then like kind of not so great neighborhood in uh, Long Beach. And he uh, owned guns, and uh, he went to the firing range a lot. And uh, if you fuck with him, he would shoot you because he fucking walked around with a gun Whoa. on the bus and stuff. So uh, <laughs> are you see what I'm saying? But yeah. He's also great. He would also go home <laughs> and play Chopin on his upright piano in his apartment. Awesome. You know? So he's a do- wow. he was a really dope guy, you know. So he's the coolest guy in the family, even more than me. So he loved movies too, in general, like great films and not so great films. And uh, he was like, hey, guys, I saw a taxi driver. I'm like really young, like six or seven. And I was like, OK, what is that? And, he's, and he just told us the ending. And he's like, yeah, man, this guy had enough. And he, <laughs> and he, he just starts shooting all these drug dealers and, and like criminals. And he shoots me, shoots this one guy. He shoots him and his hand explodes and all his <laughs> fingers fall off. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> like, what are you saying? I love and, that, I th- yeah. and I thought like, uh, oh, I'm misunderstanding what he's saying. And like, you know, I didn't see it, of course, for like many, many years. And uh, then I saw it and I went, wow, that's exactly what he described, you know? And uh, he loved it. And um, yeah, just the fingers. And I was like, uh, really haunted by that. And I saw it in a different way. I thought it was in like a, like a dirty sun drenched kind of Southern California, because we were all in Long Beach. Mm. Like I thought it was in a dirty uh, part, like abandoned lot, like, you know, in like uh, South Central in the day, uh, harsh daylight. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, that's just me (laughs) fixing that because of where we live. The the version of that movie of like, like from your six year old brain of what that movie, what you visualize. I want to see that fucking movie. I I know that. You you, you do actually. And sometimes a a black exploitation or just, you know, exploitation film would kind of resemble that. And um, actually, uh, I don't know. Well, anyway, that's if you guys have anecdotes, that's cool. Well, but it got Marcus, my mind. Go ahead. Do you do you do you oh. have any origin with Taxi Driver? I do, but yeah, go ahead. I don't. I think this is. I I you know I gotta confess. I thought I was the same with you. I thought maybe I couldn't add anything to this movie, and I I, I probably haven't watched this movie in like thirty years. Like I oh, think no the sure. last time oh. I saw it was on VHS. I mean, I'm very familiar with it. But I just a lot. There were complete scenes I did not remember going through, which is a shock for me. Oh, but um, uh, but no, I think I saw it. This is one of the first movies I saw that was like 
a big person grown up movie, you know, like um, moving yeah. on from like Goonies or Aliens or that kind of stuff to this type of movie. Um, this and like um, my dad let me watch uh, Clockwork Orange when I was really little. So that, really? I think I brought that up before, but um, but this was the right. first kind of like. You know, this Midnight Cowboy, I think going out renting it by my, you know, renting it by my friend. We were like 13 years old. And and I do remember watching it in, you know, I didn't take, I didn't go to film school, but I did take, a, like, there was like one or two film courses in school. One was history of musical theater and one was um, film production. I didn't produce any films, but we did watch Taxi Driver. And I remember I was jaded even then. I was kind of like going like, you know, it's like 18 year old me or something going like, Oh God, we're going to watch this movie. Like everyone likes this movie. It's so dumb. Like that we're, you know, like what is there to say about it? Where well, I don't know. I remember being kind of jaded by it then, but I mean, it's, I don't know, but I don't know. I don't have that much to say. I, lo- I do love this movie. It's great. You know, I don't, um, but well, that's, it's so f- that's like, you know, <laughs> it's so funny. You said that because like about, you know, this being your first big grown up movie. Cause it was for me too. I mean, prior to seeing taxi driver, my life was on a course to become, you know, a metal lead guitarist. That's where, I mean, we talked about that last week, you know, with right. me, me getting into Metallica and, and Megadeth and Slayer. That's where my head was going. I was like, I'm going to be that fucking dude. You know, that was going to be me. And yeah. then, um, and then I really saw this movie and this is true. I saw this movie, I think probably like a lot of people and it really screwed my head on with like, holy shit. Like, you know, this is a real fucking movie. Are other movies like, like the this? power of cinema? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was yeah. like, wow, I didn't know that. Cause just like you, I was, you know, Terminator guy, aliens guy, like that was me, you know, and like that stuff's cool and everything. But then when you see this, it cuts so much deeper, you know, and everything's fire, all everything's firing on all cylinders. And and you and you see this movie and you're really like, holy shit, De Niro and everything. So this movie actually changed my course to where I, I think at 15 when wow. I saw it, I think I was 15. That's when I started to like, you know, my parents signed me up for film courses, like, you know, during the oh. summer. And then I got into making movies and I totally changed my whole life around. It's a around. singular film title. Yeah. Uh, as far as influencing you about like, like going yeah. that course. Amazing. And I'm not surprised because, I mean, again, let's just say Durr once and not say it again. But it's like, yeah, it's a very powerful film. And everyone in every department is running on, you know, all cylinders. Sure. Well, but like yeah. uh because that's, also, that's really crazy wow yeah yeah, yeah. And, and it was like i remember going to friends houses and showing them this movie like hey here's something really you know legit let's watch it mm. and everyone kind of be like this is boring mm-hmm. until like you know he makes that little <laughs> thing with the gun in his arm as soon as all the kids you know saw the little like that little retractable gun thing in his arm like that's cool right. you know and all that shit yeah. um but then like you see the it prepping. now, you see it now, like, you know, when you're harder, when you've, when you've lived more and you've seen a harder side of life and you've seen some fucked up shit, mm-hmm. especially living in New York, like mm-hmm. I have 15 years and things like right. that, it cuts in a totally different way. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It's pretty interesting. Like, like this movie for me is like not really separable from like just the, how it is embedded in culture. Like, you know, like for me, I'm sure I'm positive. I saw a parody of the most famous scene before, or like someone quoting it or something before seeing oh, this yeah. movie, you know, same. Right. And, um, and like, it just was, it, it, it's popped up in all kinds of weird places. Like I remember the clash for like, had like a reference to it, one right. of the songs, you know, and that, I think right. that's why Joe Strummer has like the Mohawk and that later clash stuff. And well, I have some thoughts. You know, it's like, <laughs> um, Actually, if we could maybe transition, this could be interesting. Hey, yeah. this might be where the direction of this conversation goes um, as much as anything. And what I mean is uh, the cultural uh, ripples of the film. So I've got two little things for you guys. Um, you know, the film happened. I was a very little kid. My grandfather said that insane shit. And I was like, whoa. And then I didn't really think about it. But then everyone in the world about five years later after the film came out thought of Taxi Driver because of John Hinckley trying to kill the president of the United States of America after writing love letters to Jodie Foster, which Devo (laughs) took and made lyrics to one of their songs, if you guys don't know that. Whoa, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a song on like their Oh No album. Big Mass? Is that Big Mass? I'm not not sure. But um, yeah, all the lyrics of this song are from his, the love letters from Hinckley to (laughs) Jodie Foster. Anyway, what I'm saying is like it had this like second life as this big thing where like, like he, you know, he followed through like Travis Pickle 
and you know, uh, almost killed, uh, not a candidate, but, but a president of the United States. And so it was a lot of, con it became a much hotter film and got into sort of a different topic than just like the isolated urban loner, killer vigilante kind of thing and got into this whole like, um, uh, it's, it's actually, it's still with us in, in a way. Oh, yeah. uh, this really, yeah, this really gnarly concept of copycatting, you know, everything from like the guy who, shut up all those poor people at the Batman movie, whatever the fuck that was. Oh, and this, God, yeah. That asshole is dressed like Joker. And so this was the beginning of that. So that's, that's a dark, you know, origin story for all this. But I'll just say this. I saw, I had a bumpy road in seeing this film. So I'm only a little older and it was on television. But it was on like NBC on, uh, and I watched it and it was heavily edited. So it was kind of pointless. But it kept, like every commercial break, it had a disclaimer. I think it's on YouTube where it's like, this film is very serious. And if you, you know, and it's like, uh, it, it even like mentions John Hinckley or something. It was such a, it was a hot potato, like crazy. Was but it like, we don't endorse violence of any kind? Or something, I don't know. I read about that today. Yeah, yeah, too. probably. Up, right. Yeah. 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 Like, but then there's one, well, I was going to say one other thing about culture in the early 80s with it. I was looking at the Village Voice and I didn't really understand punk, but I was very curious. I was still very young. It's like 1981. And there was an ad for... Yeah, it was an ad for Taxi Driver playing Midnight's in the Village Voice, and it said, um, free admission for all people who have a Mohawk haircut. And I was like, holy Ooh, shit. Whoa. Because Mohawk that's, night. I'll tell you, the, the Mohawk haircut is in punk, that is directly nothing. Not the Mohicans. It was fucking Travis Bickle. That's yeah. punk. A hundred percent. And I, and I kind of witnessed it, and you'd start seeing it in the city. And, and they even wear the jacket, you know, the army jacket. Yeah. So, like, um, I didn't even connect those dots till tonight. Like, when I was, you know, I was this movie so uh, like elemental in culture. I never really even thought about the year, but now that like you know, I, like I really dug into like what was going on with like punk back then, and just adding up the years, I'm like, yes, definitely, all of that like mm -hmm. second wave mohawk shit that came with exactly punk is definitely timed out. Oh so, yeah, like, this but, is predates like, but it's eighty. No. Yeah, Quincy punks. It's like 80, yeah, but that's yeah. the thing. It's because it's 80, just to geek out, and maybe, again, this is where the conversation is going, but like to geek out, there was a second life in about 81, or in 81. So you're right, second wave punk and more suburban, as they call Quincy punks, because of the terrible Quincy episode with punks. It's right. like that's where the Mohawk blew up because of the notoriety of the film because of Hinckley and because of the attempted assassination. That's interesting. That makes sense. Yeah, that Clash album is like 83 or something. So it is. Yeah. I, I was wondering, like, why is it like seven years later that they're kind of exactly. like referencing exactly. it? Yeah, yeah, well, it and, but also, oh, good. If I can say for the audience, the song by Devo is I Desire by Devo. Just, just a quick Google search. I need here. to listen to that. Yeah. I think, um, oh. God, I think somebody, oh, the label was infuriated when they found out because Devo never told them and oh, they found yeah. out later it's like what did you do anyway so uh yeah and that's like 82 by the way that's Devo the, there you go like right in the pocket. Devo right in but the just, cut um exactly but uh I guess another th element though and this is kind of an interesting thread that we're kind of jamming on here but uh it's not uh it's not just like oh shoot Reagan you know like uh, alienation in that sense like uh with the government for punks, I think it really spoke to like, especially that urban punk, and I think it's specifically like a band like Fear, you know, you know what I mean? Like, um, where it's like, or, or even Black Flag, where it's like, I'm in the city, I'm living like Travis Bickle, and it's a very hostile, violent LA, New York City, or any other shitty, you know, urban, urban area. It's like super, not, it's not the suburbs, it's super urban. You're taking your life in your hands, you're eating one slice of pizza a day, punk rocker you know what i mean <laughs> and you're getting in fights and you're being, getting beaten up uh you know it's like very confrontational you know like you're being beaten up just because of your mohawk that kind of thing so it just well, really i think spoke to punk yeah you're well, because, inserting yourself into that seedy world too yeah, yeah. and well he's also such a or you're just poor <laughs> you know a lot of punk guys were poor like more like real punks well he's not such so a, much like circle jerks he, he, he's such an iconic like outsider you know and the whole idea yeah. is 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 sort of the alienation that he has in this movie, obviously, yes. and perfect and, word, and and that is kind of I think what you know the punks are identifying and appropriating as something cool, you know. But 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 what I saw on this viewing, just to transition here for a minute, <clears throat> is I think when I when I saw it when I was younger, I too sort of was watching it 
with the lens of this is fucking cool. He's got the retractable gun gimmick. He's got the knife in the boot. You know, he's got his hand up on the flame, brother. You know, he's got these yeah. things that are cool, right, to see and, and identify it. Yeah, like fuck he's all He's an urban this. warrior. Urban you warrior. Know? Fuck all these squares. Like, I get it. That's cool, right? But on this viewing, and I don't mean to be boring or anything by just saying, like, it's hard to ignore... <laughs> Um, you know, what's going on today, you know, just in the in, in the landscape of, you know, mass shootings happening and 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 just the, uh, the oh, whole a proud boy was shot to death yesterday. Yeah, exactly. He tried to fuck with the FBI Yeah, yeah with, a, with a nail gun. Yeah. But the idea mm -hmm. of just like, you know, the psychology behind uh, a, a person like Travis Bickle is so much more out in the open these days. So to me, it's like I'm really picking in cells up, in cell yeah. culture. Oh, of course. Exactly. And I'm just picking up on things that are much more disturbing, 10 times, 50 times. It's very disturbing. More, <laughs> yeah. Like more disturbing. It's not cool anymore, yeah. you know? And so... Um, I know what you mean. So, so yeah. can I... It, unless, Marcus, you have something to add to that. There's one scene that really stuck out to me. But Marcus, please. And then I, I'd love to talk about this one scene if we can. Oh, yeah. I want to get into that scene. Uh, just was going to mention that. Yeah, I feel it is... I was thinking about, too, like a lot of just American psychology because, uh, you know, like cowboy culture and like you know this like assassination thing goes back pretty far right and this movie was inspired by and partially by somebody who tried to assassinate george wallace and like you know there's like arthur bremer right complete because, side note there is an amazing book i actually own it it's called an assassin's diary and it's the whole book it's an expensive paperback but it's simply a transcription of arthur bremer and you're reading taxi driver travis bickle because wow. yeah you got you got to get it dude it's worth every penny uh, i'll get it oh yeah I'll um it. It, it, and i didn't mean to interject but I, i'm really glad you brought that up marcus it's um i have it i've read it and and you know um that is where paul paul schrader read it too <laughs> that's what i'm getting at so it's not an indirect yeah. reference paul right. schrader was heavily inspired by his own shitty life here in la actually and um, specifically, an assassin's diary by Arthur Bremer, wildest paperback ever, kind of. Wow. Okay, Marcus, you're reading. Yeah. Bremer. No, I mean it's uh, yeah. No, totally. That's amazing. Uh, I think it's uh, just there's something about like the there's like a weird I don't know how to express it, but it's like there's a weird uh, tension here between like you know that he's a bad guy, but he's cool, and it taps into this American thing where it's like you know that even today that he would be like a. Uh, you know, I don't know. Like he could be the like the, like the prop boy or something today. Or I have something. a lot but to say about this that. movie. Appeals to like left wing nuts too. You know, like there's something about it that just feels like you have like a he's like a hero in some way. So it's very and I feel like it is just a it feels like a very American kind of thing. And I think it goes back to like cowboy or whatever. There's all there's some deep American psychology well, Marcus, this film type you do taps know, into. You know, not to not to keep footnoting you, Marcus, but you're raising killer uh, lines of questions uh, lines of uh, uh inquiry Discussion. yeah evan you are circling the airport one second you're talking about cowboy you know another huge influence on schrader and then later scorsese is the searchers right 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 okay and that's a that's mid 50s cowboy movie starring john wayne and uh natalie wood is um kidnapped a white girl on the prairie is kidnapped by native americans and the Native Americans in this case, you know, Jodie Foster is Natalie Wood in, in Taxi Driver, and uh, the pimps and lowlifes are the uh, Native Americans in The Searchers. So there you go. You're talking about Americana. You're talking about cowboys. So there's another yeah, total huge influence on uh, the script, at least. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, th th go ahead, Evan. Let's and the look, and the look, by the way. Last thought, cowboy stuff. The look of um, Harvey Keitel's pimp is modeled after. Guess what? Like an Indian. Well, in you know what I heard about a, that? You know, in a, in a corny sense. Headband, right. I heard, long hair. I heard that uh, Harvey Keitel had a pimp in his neighborhood w where he grew up. I can't remember where, what neighborhood in New York he grew up in. But he had a pimp that li was in the neighborhood. And that's exactly how he dressed, this guy. And so he actually, wow. when he was cast in the role, he was like, I got to... Like he was going to production saying, I, I you know, because he had that long hair the guy in his neighborhood and he's like, I need to get that wig. And they're like, well, we don't have the money for that wig, you know? <laughs> and, uh, he like went to Marty and he's like, do we need this wig? Cause it's, you know, it is, he's trying to inhabit someone for real that was in his neighborhood, which right. is amazing. And so they said, fine, we'll give you the I wig. Love with the long hair. Yeah. It's amazing. But I bet yeah. that Schrader, I bet it did resonate with Schrader 
Like, uh, sure, if you're going sure. this way, I fucking love it because you do look like a stereotypical engine kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you're circling the airport, Evan. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm, I'm now circling the airport. I got to land. Marcus, so hit it, and then I'll yeah. land to well, I, Marcus kind of also hit, hit up on a ton of different topics I want to get to, um, maybe down the line in terms of that, when you talked about him as a hero thing. I won't, let's earmark that for later if we can. But the one thing I want to talk about just on this viewing in terms of like, holy shit, like how, how uh, first off, the filmmaking, you know, that really fired off for me watching it again on this one particular scene, but also just how disturbing the movie felt more so watching it again was uh, probably my favorite scenes in the entire film is the scenes with uh, Travis Bickle hanging out with his other taxi cab drivers. The, um, totally. the wizard. Peter the wizard. As the wizard. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's amazing because they're very underrated scenes. Obviously, here on One Fucking Hour, we always champion that doc style uh, sort of approach. I know we talk about that a lot. And that sort of has that in those scenes. You get to see these great, gritty New York set pieces, those cafeterias, those diners, you know, the, the, the cafeterias you walk in and the little ticket comes out, you know, and shit like that. Um, well, they're all night cafeterias, like three, because yeah. it's like 4 a.m. because they have weird hours. It's so exactly. good. Exactly. Just all these great unseen places of the city. And he captures them so well, just with texture and everything. But the characters he's creating in that scene are so three-dimensional and so true to life. Like, how about the guy that comes up and he's like, yeah, I got uh, Errol Flynn's uh, bathtub tile. You want to... There's, you wanna there's a little water that? stain. Yeah. What do you think of that? What do you think I could get for that? Yeah. That's incredible. Too real. Too real. That Too is... Real. That's a deep... See, that's some one fucking hour shit. That <laughs> makes the movie for me. That's a deep cut. I, I, I could recite every line he says, and I long for that scene. I'm like, get to him because it's so good. You see, and that guy is such a mid seventies like honky looking character actor, and you see him in other stuff, you know. Actually, um, and 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 that's the thing. It's like, uh, you know, New York is such a, a, a you know a place where it attracts people from all over, and not unlike Travis, this guy is so, kind of an oaky. You know, mm -hmm. and he's kind of bringing that like weird old like cracker honky kind of like uh, you see that like a scamming cheese ball guy is probably going to, you know, like borrow money from you and disappear and like wind up in Tulsa <laughs> stabbed in the neck, you know. So um, and uh, it's just but such a vivid character. And uh, side, so side note, uh, Peter Boyle's The Wizard. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of terrible advice moments oh, and that's, that's what i want to get to terrible advice scene ever yeah let's do that's it. I, see it yeah can i can i get there so so i just want to say real quick shout out to peter boyle he's so good in this movie he's so good at playing that sort of right wing you know you, you, obviously another one fucking hour contender is the movie joe he's kind of echoing we the joe character that. um a little bit uh in this like movie. a mellowed out joe very like mellowed out joe totally yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally i don't know totally. uh go to a whorehouse you know like yeah. uh yeah, get late <laughs> But there's this movie. He's the or, spiritual center of the movie, right? Like it's like Obi Wan Kenobi or something. I think just, no, <laughs> no. I, well, that's the it, well, he's the wizard. Called the wizard. Well, it's like you know the land of the you know the the land when of the blind. When their world is like a wise guy. I'm you know, saying yeah. the, in the land of the yeah. blind, the one eyed man is king. Um, but let and, me get and, there. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So 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 just just want to touch on this scene because it's 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 amazing when Travis is it, it's that all night cafeteria scene where. Um, you know, Travis asks, uh, asks to speak to the wizard outside, right? A kind of a uh, cry for help uh, sort of moment where he yeah. brings him outside. And then, of it's course, very there's sad, that, actually. Very, very sad. And there's that one guy, the other, the other cabbie sitting next to him, and he says, bye, killer. And he goes, you know, and that yeah. unbelievable moment. But they go well, outside. There's a lingering stare, with, and there's racial tension in that moment, you know. Totally, 100%. And so he takes him outside, and... Um, <clears throat> You know, Travis Bickle starts to confide in him about how, you know, things have got him down and he's and, and it's it's really this dark moment because that's when, you know, and then the I guess what the wizard's talking about, this bad advice, is he's talking about sort of like, well, you know, you are who your job is. You know, you yeah, are it's like, kinda well he doesn't understand. He thinks like, Oh, it's another cabbie who's kinda down on like right. having to hit the cab in the morning. He's kinda over the job and He's kind of burnt out, but boy, it runs so much deeper with Travis. And Travis is so, one of his maladies is, is he's not just inarticulate to others about his feelings, but he's inarticulate to himself. So he yeah. really couldn't even muster, he no, couldn't even guys, get close to his, his feelings no, no, to, the, to, to, to he, the wizard. 
and and these guys can't relate on any level. I mean, he's sort of just giving him. He's just sort of saying like, yeah, you know, there was a time in America, you know, when you were your job, but you know, for Travis, right. he is this. Taxi well, the wizard driver. is just like general, like classic, whatever fucked up. Like he's probably an alcoholic. Yeah. Who cares? You know. Yeah. But Travis is like several depths down in the fan- fathoms. You know. Exactly. Um, he's but, just completely. But the inter- but, what, what, Great okay. scene and very and I find it very sad because it's the last what's well, the last chance of Travis. It's it's need, the last. I didn't bring a spray tried. bottle to saying, upstate New York. I didn't bring one. Saying, go ahead, go go go. <laughs> okay, I didn't bring a spray bottle up to New York. All right, go. Uh, okay, but basically, I I, I just want to say like you know for him it's like you know the reason he became a taxi driver is and and that's what really became clear you know to me in this in, in watching it again was this idea that he can't sleep you know he wants he wants to work long hours and the reason for that is is because he wants to drown out the bad things you know and he wants to escape himself you know and that becomes and that in that moment this is the turning point for that character this scene right here and to me i never saw it that way before where it's like wow this is really the moment when this this cry for help scene is when he goes full dark side mm-hmm. and there's mm-hmm. no coming it's back it's the pivot point it's the pivot point yeah and yeah. and and to me that that is uh just well, a there's real two kind pivot points undervalued section of that yeah. movie i feel like well i mean I, it, it, Go ahead. Before we move on from The Wizard, I just wanted to, like, as a kid, I don't even, or like, you know, when I first saw this, I don't know that I picked up on it being all the levels of bad advice or, you know, like, I think, like, I took it at face value that he's like this, uh, he is like a wise guy or like he's the wise among the cabbies or whatever, you know what I mean? And yeah. Well, I'm just, funny, I'll just like, quote I, Travis. I, Travis says, that's like the worst advice I've ever heard, you know, <laughs> and, and The Wizard just like shrugs, like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just going with the, with the he movies. Just can't relate to, he just can't relate to him. He can't relate to him in yeah. any way. But also the inarticulation on Travis's part. Right. But now I, I, I did want to talk about this because I wanted to get your guys' opinion on it, you know, as the clock is running. Because to me, that scene watching it, it does feel like the point of no return. You know, he's talking about things have got him depressed to the point where he wants to take action of some dark kind. And of course, like I was mentioning... Bad we thoughts. Live, bad thoughts. We, we live in a time where... People with a lot of bad thoughts go out and do things, right? And so I'm thinking, I don't know, I want to get your guys' take on this because when that stuff happens, that's when we go into those montage scenes we've been talking about. That's when he puts his, you know, his fist under the fire. That's when Urban Warrior Prepping. Urban Warrior Prepping. He's doing all that stuff, right? That's when the scene happens when super grim scene when he shoots the guy holding up the convenience store as well. Ugh, it's all going on yeah, a horrible scene. But everything's happening after that right but then iris comes into the movie and i wanted to get your guys's take on this because maybe you know sometimes we talk about on this show like you know when we talk about perfect movies are are there one thing that kind of rubs you the wrong way Mm. i kind Mm. of feel like in the scene with de niro even though he's very charming uh with iris uh when he tries to rescue her you know from this world i Mm. kind of feel like it's not really authentic to the character you know i kind of feel like a little Hollywood cheese coming in a little bit of this of him, him. Um, like I get that. I mean, their the breakfast, point. their breakfast together, like their breakfast together. And the idea, like, I feel like he's already past that point. What do you guys think? Well, isn't part of it that he's like an, an authentic human being too? Like he's, he seems to be struggling to like act normal in life. You know, like it always stuck out to me that when he goes out with Silva Shepherd, he's like, I ordered a slice, of, you know, a, a slice of pie with melted cheese on top, which I think was a good choice. You know, like <laughs> that line always stuck out to me because I'm like, what does that mean? And I, what I interpret it now is he's like, I was, I think I was looking like a normal human being at that moment. Well, you know, to I, speak to what you're saying and so how I'm, and how off he is from being normal. Let's also quote Travis and saying after she runs out of the porno that he takes her to, goes, I don't know. It's not so bad. There's worse porn. I see a lot of couples go to this. Yeah. You know, he's so cool. Yeah. I don't know much about so movies. Like, so I guess that, that could be with Iris is that he's he also is just acting a character or trying to be like a, a normal. Perhaps. Acting how he thinks a normal person should act. I don't or agree with that you know? because, because he had to take the initiative to even talk to her. Like she didn't come to him. I have a thought. If, Please. if, if uh, you know, if, yeah. if that, that is where this is going conversation, there's actually, I think, two pivots. There's pivot A and, well, there's actually one pivot, and then there's a, a uh, reflection of where the effects of the pivot. I think the first pivot is the rejection of Sybil Shepherd's character. Mm. That's actually the heart of the center of the film and the pivot point where he dips over. And I think it relates to Iris. This is why I'm bringing it up, because 
he's doing a thing with women. I mean, he's very alienated from everyone, but particularly women. But of course, he's a male, so he's a, he's excited and, and, and driven, drawn to women. You know, he comes on to the girl who works at the porno, sh- uh, you know, concession stand at seven in the morning. You know, like he's you know he's 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 lonely and he wants to be with a woman. So he has a very screwed up kind of Madonna whore thing, or almost just only a Madonna thing about women. The way he talks about the Civil Shepherd character is like, she's all in, I'm paraphrasing, she's all in white. She's pure. Nothing can touch her. Right, like she's right. an angel floating above this disgusting, ugly right. city, which is hell on earth. He's she's gone. Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. She's gone. Like, she's not a real person. She's yeah. this idealized uh, uh, vision of like uh, p- female purity. She rejects him. She's, uh, she's gone. He turns to another projection on uh, the idea of feminine purity in, in the form of the 12 year old girl, not sexual. Of course, he's not thinking I want to date her, but right. he's idealizing her and not allowing her to maybe have a complex 12 year old childhood where she's maybe kind of like having sexual thoughts or like um, rebelling and acting out. You know what I mean? He's just like, you're a little girl and you're floating above this disgusting hell on earth, New York city. So he's actually cha- he's transferring from Shepard to Iris. And I think he has a hundred percent genuine interest in her. You though, guys, Evan, you started this, are raising a point that actually Kale had as a compunction with the film. Oh, wow. And De Niro's performance. And, and if you were saying, you know, we, we tried to start this and we it's were the criticizing. Performance. The li- it's it, well, it, 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 Can I say that that's I what I kind of meant? This? It, it's, it's the performance no, no, totally, I was, I, yeah. That's well, all I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And what I'm saying is we had this fun idea when we did our what first did you show. Say? I don't know what you're agreeing with, but what did you say? Well, just what just you one say? second. I wanted to preface this concept because we abandoned it. We had a perfect film in our first film, Deliverance, and we had a great time nitpicking. And we never really <laughs> did it again. But I think we're doing it today. So I'm sorry. Uh, Evan, finish your thought. But this is a nitpick. da dum on a near perfect film go ahead yeah and I, I know exactly where you're going with this so i'll just reiterate it's just like to me just to make it clear uh after all of the sort of you know travis spiraling down stuff that we're watching very dark very disturbing especially in today's world compared to today's world and um when he sits down has breakfast with iris and there's the iris stuff it doesn't mm-hmm. his performance to me uh the way that or it's written or his performance feels inauthentic to where his the, the the trajectory the thread of where the character is going it it feels a little phony and I, and, I, and to me uh you know and, and I don't know I'm not trying to have a hot take here I just was watching it and being very disturbed and maybe I'm projecting a lot of what we know the psychology of you know mass shooters and weirdos today and stuff but mm-hmm. but to me it was like hmm I don't know. I don't know if he'd have it all together to be like, you should be out of here. You shouldn't right. be here. What are you doing? You know, I, I know if I can just uh, to totally piggyback on your observation. That's very interesting. Yeah. And I before you even said this today, because you brought up like, is there a flaw in a perfect film? And I thought, OK, <laughs> I'll follow what Pauline Kael said. She had a few criticisms of Taxi Driver, like three or four. Uh, and she said um, she was actually not buying the charming way that De Niro was with Sybil Shepherd. Oh, okay. Not Iris, but Sybil oh, okay. Shepherd. And I and I I kind of shut it out because I'm very protective of this film, but I like I let it in. And now you're saying this about him and Iris. And she's like, Kale is saying, where did this charming guy who could have a little back and forth with a girl, you know, over coffee, like because where did that come from? Because otherwise I'm seeing a guy who's like almost drooling and saying, oh, I want to go on a date at seven in the morning when he's buying O. Henry bars at a porno, you know, uh, theater. So so it, right. it did ring false to her. So it's interesting. And I guess I don't know if it's a flaw, but I know it's a little weird. I agree with you. And that is coming down to the choice in him taking that turn in his performance. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, it. Uh, that's. I think what's part of the things that makes him like a that the audience one of the ways the audience can be kind of sympathetic to him too is because when De Niro does have those charming moments in his yeah. performance it might it's be not too like dark. he's trying to play like a pure psychopath or something or yeah. like you know like I don't I'm not a big American psycho fan but just to pick that movie it's like he always is like I'm a crazy person that you don't like there's nothing you don't you don't like that character you don't want to be him you don't want to be a vigilant you don't want to do you know so I think like there's something about this character though that people like and 
You yeah. Know, that it's hard. Even yeah, though you know yeah. he did this horrible thing, yeah. you still like him. And like, there's like weird American murder fantasies all tied up in there. So I think it's like, there's something about, and it might be attributed to his like kind of the way that he, that De Niro does let the charisma through, you know, every, Maybe. every now and again. Or again. Scorsese allowed it to get through. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a little bit of that, you know, cause it's he weird does, choice. Yeah. It, it is a weird choice. And, and, and to me it's prop like it, I kind of chalk it up to be like, well, maybe this movie would have been just too misanthropic, you know, or or maybe you know you needed a little producer note in there to have something like this, like this character with Iris and all that other stuff, and and his performance, because um, with the Betsy character, you know, Sybil Shepherd, it's so I think that's really well done because that to me, I'll tell you another scene. So when they when they leave the uh, the porno theater and he's like, you know, I I just I don't know movies, you know, to me that that works so well with the character because I think that there is there is some sort of self sabotaging element to him where it's like he's Mm. got this thing with her. And he almost breaks through because, you know, he, he is the outsider. He's at the bottom rung of society, but he almost mm-hmm. breaks through. He gets this date. He goes through. He has this big moment date. where he gets her. Yeah. But it's but it's that self-sabotaging thing where it like That's where, he just, where like he wants to reaffirm. He wants to reaffirm his nihilism. And now we can blame the world for everything like, fuck you, bitch. Ooh, and, interesting point. And, and that scene when he marches in to confront her is later at the campaign office. Very scary ass shit. That dude, that's uh, active shooter time. The vibes. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. That is active shooter vibes. Like for it, it's real. It's frightening. Yeah. It's frightening. Yeah. Well, yeah. what does he scream when he leaves? You're all going to hell. Yeah, I mean, that's when you hear that in a city street, you run away. I know. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, that, you're all going I mean, to hell. I think that that brings up something. Like now, I'm going to disagree with Tom on something actually. Because I back to that Iris thing. I don't. That's why I think he's not really genuinely interested in her. He's just hanging like he's got all this um, rage towards society. And he, I think he really just wants to kill people. And he's looking for an excuse to because, I mean, like he was going to kill the president or whatever, you know, or the guy running for president. So I think like he's not necessarily and that's like not that's kind of tangentially related to Sybil. But he gets sort of just misdirected into that. I guy, know what it is. You know? so, I know what it is. It's 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 I think for this movie, they were looking for, you know, some way to make him heroic in some way to because she's someone that can be saved he can't be saved because he's too far gone she's somebody that is part of the filth world that is too you know that still has a chance and i think that's kind of what they were trying to say with that you know to, to some that. extent. but his savior well, is saving her is so fucked up he's like you know like he oh, murders yeah. three people in front of her and her life is destroyed yes. right then you know it's like so he saved her you know like it's so uh well i know. mean I, you know, I actually wanted to bring this up with you guys um, right where we're going with this conversation. I think, and this is very much uh, time for like Paul Schrader as one of the big elements of the film. Ding! It's Paul Schrader time. There is a moral ambiguity, and I'll just put it this way, maybe very bluntly, a modern active shooter, those pieces of shit, like the, those poor people in Aurora, Cal- Colorado, whatever. He doesn't, he can't even see their faces. He's no idea they are. It's like kids and stuff. But, yes, he has a murder, an inclination to murder, and it, of course, involves assassination, but then it defaults down to what he feels as pieces of shit human beings. These people, <laughs> I mean, he kills, one of the people he kills pimps a 12-year-old girl and talks about, like, you can, like, you know, take her this way, that way, turn around, <laughs> and, like, that guy is a miserable piece of shit, yeah. and, you know... If I had heard a person like that did get popped in the street, I'd shrug. That's not to me like an Aurora, Colorado kind of moment. And the other guys are equal pieces of shit. They're in the mob, clearly. You know, they're taking the, the money and, and they're exploiting like 12 year old girls. So what I'm saying is there's um, this is very what? Paul Schrader territory. No, hold on. It's like there's a moral ambiguity in his target, not the assassination attempt. I agree with that. But there's a moral ambiguity, and I think he's he's affixing a ton of things, and he's doing this thing that's very American, like you were saying, Marcus. He's mythologicalizing this entire circumstance. He's he's objectifying Iris as the as like the thing that is needs to be saved from being brought down by a living hell and the demons. New York City's a hell on earth, and the demons are these miserable pimps in the alleyway, and I need to take her get her home, get her going to school and rescue her, which is also like in The Searchers, which influenced the film, 
And I think there's some moral ambiguity there because he's not simply just starting to shoot people in Times Square. And I think okay. that that makes the film very tense yeah. and a, a very a real hot potato, you know, and yes. that's where there was a lot of fear about vigilante justice in general in the 70s. This is a post, right. you know, a death wish film. Totally. Please. And, and, and you know, 100%, I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I think that, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is in the lens, I, it's hard to watch this movie without just, you know, what's happening in our world today. It's hard to see it, to unsee, you know, that, right? And so yeah, I yes. think I think that, you know, this movie, just because of its probably its time, you know, and, and when it was written and when it was put together, it's like by today's standards, mass shooters you know, are people who, who have an urge to commit those sort of things. They're not that cool. They're not going to, like, stop, you know, um, some sort of, like, you know, a sex trafficking operation. Well, or they're, not they're not yeah, crusaders. They're not crusaders. They're, they're mythology. Yeah. It's it's pure yeah. nihilism. I mean, they're shooting, nihilism. you know, five-year-olds. Yeah. Right. No, it's like, um, it, so there's a huge difference. But in a way, right. there is no difference because it's violence. Right. Um, but but one last psychology. thought. It's the same psychology oh. that we're seeing on display, like, yeah, you know, I in agree. this movie. I agree. And, and I just want to say that to me, if this movie were made today or made in maybe a, a little bit more authentic way, it it's like not he, happen. It wouldn't. But he would go into the <laughs> Palantine office. He'd be shooting up fucking Albert Brooks and he'd be shooting up the well, like you're saying, yeah, the campaign. You're all going to hell. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. right. Good point. Yeah. But there's one other thing. Can, okay, please. Uh, well, if there's one other thing, but I was going to bring up something that I don't like about the movie. <laughs> Ooh, fun, always fun here at one fucking hour. It's always fun to shit on. <laughs> I love no, movies. not that. No, no, no. It's like, like, well, like, we're, like we've said, it's a no, thread. I know, I know. On. It's like, it's are you perfect? No, you're ninety nine percent perfect. That was yeah, yeah. so yeah. fun about Deliverance. There's, some, on, there's a friend. moment. I, there's another scene that I don't. A whole scene I don't like is that Ooh. when that <laughs> he that he actually picks up Palantine in the cab. You know, like, okay. that's just like too oh, much of a know. coincidence that right, makes right. the world feel really small and it bothers me, you know. Not bad. Yeah, the coincidence. Except yeah. for, except uh, for, gotcha. except for maybe he might have found a more tasteful way to do it. But I do think like it's trying to communicate the idea hmm of the kind of class structure or the like like you know like like because i think that paul schrader i don't know this for sure but maybe he's kind of poking fun at the the political candidate and 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 sort of his very oh, you know, surface, surface level sort of, oh, of like, like i represent no, the people like, and i understand people well, like you well let me ask you you're a working man yeah what yeah, do yeah, you yeah, think yeah. needs to be fixed in this country travis you know yeah of course. Right, right and he gives him like a really really generic you know answer that you can hear it however you know you can hear it however you want and he's like well it's gonna take he's like we well, gotta clean up the street you know and, and and the palatine's like well it's not gonna be easy you know and everyone yeah. hears that differently right so right but i i i totally understand it is a little you know perfect there to have that um hey let's change it from the theoretical and get into some nitty gritty because we've got less than 20 minutes. And what I mean yeah. by that, if you guys don't mind, let's do a quick round table of some favorite supporting actors. What do you say? <laughs> we did one with the, uh, the honky guy with uh, Peter Boyle. Errol Peter Boyle. Flynn's uh, Dials and, and Peter well, Boyle. Don't we all but, have like, the same favorite? Well, no, oh, yeah. but I'm just saying let's talk about like some of the other great characters in this film. Sure. Um, well, let's yeah. go for the gold. Okay, totally. We will. Um, uh, yeah, I do want to talk about the ending shoot scene. I want to make sure we get that enough time. Save time for that. Um, <clears throat> okay. okay to break uh, it up a little. We're getting we'll a little down. Up. Well, okay. Favorite people in the movie. Okay, I I'm going to start with one. I know it's on your list. You know, and this th this highlights Scorsese as a great director. Uh, obviously, we haven't really put him over at all on the show, but he's great and he's super good at creating that real texture, incorporating doc style el elements, like we said. But he's also a very spontaneous filmmaker, and 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 grabbing real life and throwing it into a movie, like the guy he's a great with the doc maker himself. Yeah, I'm sorry, Evan. Like the guy with the uh, uh, shoe polish hair who's uh, doing the old drum solos in the middle of the street. Come on. Oh, Gene Krupa, 1938. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, that guy fucking rules. Amen. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't forget about him now. Um, Good and, call. And of course, we have to Love talk him. about, uh, if we're talking about people who have cameo roles or character actors, we have to talk yeah. about Scorsese's scene himself that he oh, has of course <laughs> you would why don't you recite some of his dialogue evan right now 
uh, on the internet. Uh, it, I noticed tonight he's in it twice. Did he's in it twice. He is. Yeah, yeah. He's, a, yeah. There's a fleeting, like a Hitchcockian cameo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When he's actually if, saying nothing can touch her. Do you think it's uh, the uh, same guy? By. Do you think it's supposed to be the same guy? No, no, no. Not at all. Okay. No <laughs> it's his twin brother? Okay. Um, I know. The other well, that guy, guy runs like like he works with his brother in a plumbing business. Yeah, right. the, the guy in the back seat of the cab. And now you, you want to recite that entire scene that he, his oh, dialogue. Yeah. Don't you? Now, you should Evan, see what that. Right? No, no, you should. You ever see what it can do to a woman's pussy? And that you should see. That you should see what a forty-four magnum is going to do to a woman's pussy. You should see. Oh, you are doing this. Okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. There's worse words. It's ugly. Yeah. It's the yeah. ugliest thing ever. It freaks out Travis. He just stares at him. It's you know. You no. Know, it's you know what's so great? intense. It's unbearable. It's it's really one of the best performances it's of the unbearable. movie. It's unbearable. And do you know what makes that scene? Here's a one fucking hour detail. What makes that Please. scene so amazing is when he's going off about that, you know, and the, the whole thing. Um, and the moment when it's like scary for Travis is there's a little shot from behind Travis's head. Do you, do you remember this? It's like, it's like we're now reversal... POV of uh, Martin uh, Scorsese's Scorsese POV. Character. Yeah, and okay. It's just a static. I'll, I'll cut to it right here. Static, creepy back shot of Travis Pickle's head, and that one shot is just makes mm. sets the mood again. for that. Yeah, it's amazing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, wow. so we love the director making um, a really unforgettable <laughs> one of the uh, most character. insane director cameos <laughs> of all time. I know, just like a hundred percent repellent, misogynistic. Homicidal piece of shit. It's a nightmare scene. And that's part of Travis. He couldn't find trajectory. anybody that would actually deliver that dialogue. So he's just like, oh, <laughs> it was going to be myself. somebody. Else. Wait, it was. Evan, yeah. we talking, it was going to be somebody else, and then the guy fell through. And he, he got, Chris he, says he's like, I'll do it. He couldn't what make it? it. He couldn't show up, or he got Who's sick, or some something. guy. Yeah, I can't right. remember. That's my yeah. theory. Last... It's twice is because he, he already shot his cameo once, you know, and then he's like, "Oh God, now I have to be this character in it." So that's why. That's my theory as to why. Got to do it. Twice. One of them's like it. near unrecognizable. I love that he stepped in for it, though. I love that. <laughs> no, it's great. So one of the round. So on the round robin, now this is talk about genius. You've got a. You've got. Um, it's 1975. They're shooting the film. Scorsese doing like huge fat rails, you know, on Saturday night, up all night, like, hey, what's this thing, SNL? What is this shit? What's going on? I'm, I'm in the zeitgeist, it's New York City. Near, oh, Saturday Night Live. Whoa, there's this weird filmed piece. Who's this guy who does these weird film pieces in the first season of Saturday Night Live? He's really funny, he's really weird, he's really trippy, I love this. Ring, mm. ring, give him a call. Albert Brooks, a friend of the show, we did modern romance <laughs> recently. He he kills it. It's of course as you'd expect. Scorsese just said improv everything, just be Albert Brooks, and he does, and it's hilarious. It's like um, he's trying to do the trick that Betsy's saying he couldn't do, which is having only his pinky and his uh, thumb, like light a match, and he's like, well, okay, and like, well, I got my finger back for a second, so I can light this match. Brilliant. Hilarious. Um, how about the little quip? Um, like, uh, put your glasses on. Look at this guy. And he's like, okay. And he already had his glasses on. Albert Brooks. That's Can I a, say something about that? Can I say something about that? I, I actually saw a little interview with him about uh, this being, being in this movie. And it was kind of amazing because brilliant choice again on Scorsese to cast Albert oh. Brooks in this movie for this kind of oh, part, you know, it. but apparently in the script, the character was just really not really fl fleshed out much at all. Mm. And so, so Albert Brooks basically helped to write all of his, his own lines. I think he wrote all of his own lines. So I just said, right. He's like improv yeah. go totally. And, right. um, but it, it was funny just to hear him comment on when he was coming up with it. He basically said like, you know, this character, he can't be funny. You know, he has to be regular office guy funny, you know, and, yeah. I, and he is. No. <laughs> well, and that's yeah, the thing. You know, it's funny, too. There's a point to his character. It's not simply, um, you know, like a little breather, which is funny. There's actually humor in Taxi Driver, kind of, you know, uh, it's surprising in a way. Uh, oh, yeah, and it's yeah. so refreshing, the contrast. But also, more significantly, and most significantly, is Travis Bickle chimes in on the Albert Brooks character. You know, he says to Betsy, you know, like, I, I don't I don't have a problem with him, but I think he's silly. You yeah, know? that's amazing. And so and what the thing is, is and this is interesting, you know, obviously, Albert Brooks is making very clear. I want to date you, Betsy, and yeah. she's not interested at all. And I think that she, you know, she wants to listen to like, you know, Chris Christopherson and like Blood on the Tracks, Dylan, like she wants to she has like heavier feelings. And Albert Brooks is a very silly person. She would agree with Travis like he is silly and trivial. 
But Travis is more like a blood on the tracks kind of deep guy in his own weird way, at least his first impression to her. And so it's I like what they did is they contrasted the two males in her life at this moment in time of a person who um, doesn't do anything for her. And there's a person who, like but what I'm saying is you can see then by contrast, she's intrigued by Travis because he seems to have an edge, a depth and an intensity that some silly office boy who like makes little goofy jokes and stuff uh, right. not, doesn't give that at all to her. I mean, she wants heavy blood on the tracks kind of guy. So um, the <laughs> other, just we're round robining here, uh, one of maybe, maybe my favorite cameo of all time is American boy, Stephen Prince. Uh, Stephen Prince is uh, Easy Andy. That's his character. He's Easy Amazing. Andy <laughs> in a rented hotel room because that's how this guy rolls. He crystal meth? I can get you crystal meth. Yeah, where it's like a nitrous oxide, <laughs> like LSD, mescaline, let's go. And like, no, so he sells, he's a gun, he's an illegal you know, dealer, and he has all these guns, and it's an incredible scene. And, you know, yes, it's American Boy. If you're familiar with the documentary that uh, Martin made a couple years before, uh, Stephen Prince is just a friend of Martin, just kind of a wild, crazy guy. I actually got to know Stephen Prince in the past amazing. few years. Yeah, amazing. Uh, you know, I befriended him, and I've like I had dinner with him and stuff, and he's a great guy, very fun, very cool. And so, um, it's American Boy of, is one of the best like docs. Know. It's so highly awesome. recommend it. Okay. Everyone should see that. Yeah, and um, and that's uh, and 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 that's Easy Andy. That's a great cameo. Now, I know we're really running out of time. If you don't mind, just like kind of like a power move on moving forward. Maybe some favorite scenes, I, like I isolate have... scenes. How about we get through the ending stuff? Because I want to talk about the ending. Then we do that. So do that, sure and ending. then we can roll through yeah. a couple killer scenes. Go. Yeah, I know. Bleeding time. Okay. So obviously, the ending. Let me just set it up. The ending gun battle. You know, with the movie. Obviously, it's it's so well done. You know, from a technical I standpoint. I mean, it's amazing how sloppy it is in terms. How of about just the sound of it? Sound. It's abstracted and echoey. Yeah. <laughs> So awesome. And just, you know, the, the idea of just, yeah, all the choreography, the special effects, it's incredibly gruesome for the time. It's the, the it's, tracking it's, camera. Yeah. Oh, uh, the overhead uh, tracking camera. Overhead track amazing. camera over the, uh, through the uh, apartments. But I, I wanted to get your guys' take because even going back to when I saw this movie originally, when I watched it all the time back when I was 15, 16. As soon as the camera slow mo tracks outside with the cop cars and the lights and everything, mm. that's where I wanted the movie to end, and that's where I actually I know I know that's, that's where I stopped Many, the movie. That's actually where I would actually <laughs> hit stop. You know, many say that yes, and 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 it it, it feels yeah. like I don't want to. I feel like I'm recutting Taxi Driver here, but. It, like I, it just feels like you know, like what Tamarcus was saying earlier on in the episode is like you know, and and in reality, she's probably you know, Jodie Foster's character is going to be horribly fucking traumatized by you know, don't kill him, don't kill him, shoots the guy in the fucking face, you know, and then all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And so, um, to me, I wanted to open it up to you guys to sort of talk about that because to me, it feels like the ending of this movie should be her screaming while the credits are rolling, but instead we get a little bit of an epilogue. So, well, that slow mo pull out. So powerful, and the music swell. We even talked about the music, the swelling music. Yeah, it's uh, it's stunning. Uh, uh, the the resolution of the massacre. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, are you asking? So I, I just want to ask thought. because the epilogue. Obviously, some people say it's a dream. Some people say it's a fantasy. Some people say it's not. You know, Scor Scor I totally. Scorsese has chimed in on this. Okay, tell me. I don't know what that is. And or Paul Schrader, mm -hmm. if this is helpful to you guys, because it is somewhat controversial, and I have. Uh, I don't know how I feel about it a lot of times, but Scorsese has said, no, that is not a dream. That is reality. And that is what happened. And this is, and if you really understand Paul Schrader, you can see then um, why he would want to have that epilogue and, um, and how it, uh, it, it, what it does is illustrating uh, like a correction and uh, of uh, a chaotic world and a chaotic city and a chaotic man. It's actually an incredibly dark thought where, he purges himself through mass murder and killing the quote unquote bad guys. He purges himself in a blood ritual and he comes out of it a more whole centered and at peace human being. It's <laughs> what he needed, a purging act of violence against quote unquote bad guys. 
And that's very Paul Schrader. And, um, and it also gets into like almost like biblical shit. You know what I mean? So if it's not a dream, which I could see the reasoning for that, there's a few things. There's new, if it's not a dream, there's articles that he's got pinned up and, 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 and correspondences with Iris's parents. Thank you, sir. You saved my daughter's life. You know, she's back. She's feeling good. She's okay. She's back home now in Iowa bullshit. And, um, you know, that's, that's actually to me more chilling than almost anything because it's saying the film's message is sometimes you need to just fuck shit up and get it out of your system and, and purge yourself through got, a, blood, a trial of blood. I got something Yikes. on this. I got some, that's a scary thought, but I think they do resolve that. And another, like, I know Scorsese has also talked about the very last thing that you see is like, right. He, uh, the, the very the, last, he sees something and he, everything's golden again. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he's going to be a, it's never golden, not golden again, but not, for the but first he's like time. A, not golden, but hold on, let me talk. Okay. So he's like, I'm a member of society. I'm people are giving me praise or whatever. I'm a newspaper, you know, people. So all that Betsy's really back. Happened. Betsy's back. It's not a dream. By the way, dream. I always get bummed out. People like attribute everything. Every movie theory is like or a whatever, dream. I get yeah. so sick of that, you know, but whatever. Um, so, but at the very end, he's like, uh, he, he drops her off or whatever. Then all of a sudden he's driving away. Then all of a sudden he sees something in the rear view mirror. And there's like a sound cue there that supposedly, of course, as he said, this last thing that the last sound cue that Bernard Herrmann gave him for the movie was that like in the, into the, the into the, uh, the rear backwards, view mirror. Backwards sound effect. Yeah. And he says that, you know, that's the sound of him, like the ticking time bomb starting again or whatever is starting Whatever is going to, you know, the, the cycle starting over again, the movie ends, how mm -hmm. it begins with the mm -hmm. titles and the, and the smoke and stuff. And it's supposed to be like, this is going to repeat itself again. Right. You know, next time well, it may not work out well. I think Schrader said like this, yeah. it may not work out well for Travis the next time. That Well, that's what I was just going to say is there's, there's, Tax Driver has three endings. And I usually hate that. A lot of bad modern movies have three endings. It has the ending you're talking about, the slow-mo pullout of the massacre, Evan. There's the um, the resolution where it becomes golden and feels unreal and dreamlike, but he actually has gone through a purge of blood. We were just talking about all that, and Betsy's there, and he kind of rejects Betsy, you know, which is like it feels good to him. But yes, there's a third tiny ending, which is quite unnerving. It's what you're saying, which is, and it becomes highly stylized, unlike yeah. the rest of the entire film. Yeah. A backward sound effect, a, a, a quick, a, a sped up zoom. And he looks very insane. And that's actually the final note of the film. And the final note of the film is this guy, it's sort of like the ending of like a horror movie where it's like, you know, the hand comes out of the, the grave, like dun, 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 you know, like, like Travis is still Travis and he, maybe he's worse than ever. And he's thinking that the solution to everything is a fucking bullet to people's heads. It's in, it's darkness upon darkness. Yeah. It's one of the most darkness endings ever. Yeah. Total side note, I met Thelma Shoemaker. I swear to God. And she said that uh, there's a shot in Tales of Hoffman that they both were inspired by for that, oh, one, that final shot. Interesting. So throwing oh, that out there, hint to you, Evan, well, I'm just it's the say, look of someone in yeah. Tales of Hoffman. I'm just going to say then we can rapid fire here. But you know, to me, it's like I kind of just want to see like a full noir ending to this movie. Jodie Foster's scream, total EC Comics ending, you know, with the credits mm -hmm. rolling, with pure <laughs> fucking dread, yeah. you know? None of this Travis dying auteur bullshit. The reboot. <laughs> yeah, reboot. I know. Okay. Well, you know what? You didn't get that. And we got three endings. Yeah. You've got the ending. You brought up Evan. I brought up the second to last. And you brought yeah, up three the more third. endings. Three last, fucking last endings. One, Evan. Three fucking yeah, endings. Yeah. Three endings. And they just, and how about Let's this? Do, Sequentially darker, darker, darkest. Wow. Can we do like, we, we don't have time for scenes, but I mean, we have time for like, just to everyone get something off their chest before the, uh, the I time have a runs scene. Out. I'll have a scene and then I will completely shut up and maybe it's... Um, you have two minutes. The Go. film's very... <laughs> yeah. Got it. The film, not not uh, a it, full two minutes. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's very sad. This film, I think it's mostly sad, the emotion yeah. from this film. He's a tragic character, exemplified by this incredible scene. He's watching uh, television, a fucking... He's really at the end of his rope and Stole he's um, drinking in the day or something. It's like he's watching soap operas, but he's not even watching. His eyes are glazed over. He's holding a gun and he's watching and he's and he's kind of rocking back and forth what's keeping up his tv showing soap operas it falls over 
and then uh, the, the TV breaks, explodes. Big, great uh, music cue. Uh, you know, uh, Bernard Herrmann's incredible. And he just holds his head. It's like Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He's holding the gun, and he's holding his head. And he's like, uh, and he's so gone. And it's such huge tragedy. And it's the yeah. best shot in, in this film, I th- maybe ever. Go. I, I, I thought you were going to steal mine. I'll be quick, and Marcus, you take us home. Mine is actually the other TV scene. I actually am a bigger fan of oh. the e- total emo mass shooter moment where he's watching American Bandstand with that song. Is that yours, Marcus? Jackson that Brown is, is uh, playing. Jackson Brown. Yeah. I was going to mention that. I, I totally forgot that scene existed. That, this ing- was like the first time I'd seen it. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. an incredible well, scene. You know, they're, they're yeah. parented. I mean, not parented, but they're, they're, they they're paired. Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful stuff. Travis yeah, watching so, okay. TV. All right, Marcus. I, well, I just think like that ties in with like just the, the general scorsese that's in that, like kind of rears its head in this movie, you know, like the pop song moment that like, it feels mm-hmm. really good, you know, like cathartic to watch. And you're just like emotionally engaged in the movie at mm-hmm. that moment. And then also the, the camera work is like feeling super Scorsese in this movie, all the push ins, pushing in on something, dollying down, you know, dollying oh. down and then lowering the dolly and all those shots are just all the hallmark they go. He goes really hard into later. Like some movies feel like they are like, yeah, I don't know, Wolf true. of Wall Street feels like they overdo it maybe, but like yeah, this yeah. movie, it feels like a great balance. It feels light years away from like, you know, all the movies that are around it at that time. It really feels like it's pushing the form. It doesn't feel like a 70s movie to me. It feels like it's I from agree with you. like a later It's another era, level. You know? We went to another level. Cinematography. Well, that's it. Hey, guys, yeah. I'm going to run and get something. Uh, I'm saying time's up. Talk to yourself. I'll be right back. Let me get this. <laughs> all right, everybody. Dang. That is uh, one fucking hour on uh, Taxi Driver. Hey, what's He's going to go uh, get a mohawk, I think. What's well, He's just shaving his head aggressively right now. What's in the background <laughs> there? Uh, what are we looking at there, Tom? Um, <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, that was one fucking hour on Taxi Driver, everybody. Felt like it was a little bit of a battle at times, trying to... Little little cage match there to try and get uh, all of our thoughts of this wonderful movie in, but that's that's part of the show. The clock's on, the heat is on, the, the time working against the time. It's um, three people fighting for to get their points in about the, uh, the or movie two an hour or two people fighting to get there. <laughs> Wait, who's who's not fighting? Are you you thinking you're not fighting for time? <laughs> all right, guys, c- calm down. For you, it's either. entertaining, and we only <laughs> and stupidly set up just an hour. Now, I was just looking, and I cannot goddamn it find it. Oh, it's over there. Um, I have The Assassin's Diary, the Arthur Bremer book, oh. and it's amazing. And I guess, Evan, you could probably pop on the cover. Yes, uh, pop on right now. Post. But I did find this when I was looking for um, that book. So oh. nice. this wow. is like the paperback, you know, more or less <laughs> the 70s or late 60s paperback that, you know, they were throwing around. Like De Niro gave it to Scorsese. And he's like, so that's what he would have <laughs> read. You know, yeah, exactly. Like almost literally just this beat up. There's a nice, uh, awesome. there's a, there's a very nice patina very cool. on that copy there you have. Um, no, I know it's, it's, it's a really cherished topic. It was like 50 cents. That's cool. Ah, that's awesome. Over there. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, again. okay. All right. I'll be right back. Give me 10 okay. seconds. Okay. You know, we didn't, you know, this is a, there was a, uh, Peter Bogdanovich connection to that movie, right? Um, so Peter B? Shepherd. Oh, of course, yeah, Peter right? B. Yeah, Peter B. <laughs> we should. The, the, this whole show should just be six degrees of Peter B. Um, but <laughs> it probably is so far, you know. Yeah, it probably is. Yeah, but that uh, it was interesting. Like you know, I, I I came into this again just like a couple days ago, not knowing at all what I was going to talk about for this movie. But I think we did look and examine at some interesting topics and 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 <laughs> Dude, really I thought it was great. Us criticize some 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 td so. absolutely and 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 we were mulling things over i don't know how i feel about some aspects of the film i thought we did find a couple clunker moments which i, I really love that's like a pet thing that i like about our show <laughs> which is like that one little 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 well no i was calling it like um a dead pixel of the film yeah dead pixel right. like your dead tv's fine but there's like one little like <laughs> i forgot what it is in deliverance but okay drum roll i found it Woo! everyone needs to read this book it's un- it's not a book it's, it literally is just this weird asshole's diary and um Here, show sh- the camera. it's almost like schrader say again oh sorry yeah there you go. schrader um should almost be sued because this book is taxi driver i'm not even wow. kidding because you know there's diary entries in taxi driver right right 
and right. and just uh, uh, I wish I prepped this. I just forgot. I could have read something from you guys. That's okay. Oh. Okay, you know what? I will uh, cheat. Uh, April 4th, 1972, 8.30 a.m. Hooray, hooray, great day for democracy and capitalism. You know, like uh, he's, he's, he's uh, tracking and stalking uh, the candidate um, for president that he uh, shoots. Wow. Not, doesn't kill, but he shoots. Uh, buy this book right now. Uh, Evan, this is for you, Evan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm love it. I love when there's a movie you this need big. This book. I love when there's a movie this big and like all the source material is kind of out in the world and you people know about it, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. there's a people are talking about online about the David Hockney movie, which I love a bigger splash. And like that was a part of his um, Scorsese's like influence, you know, inspiration for this was? Like, photography style. Yeah, I know. Shocker. I was like so weird. But like I love when you can in the Hitchcock, obviously, and, you know, oh, yeah. um, with because of Bernard Herman. I just love when there's all those source materials out there. I find it so inspiring because I feel like a collage type creative person myself where like I'm taking bits and pieces. And you feel like mm -hmm. you're just assembling things that you don't really have ownership of. But then you realize that that's what hey, someone like take, Scorsese is doing, too. If you, know? you so, like I think I if find you that mash really inspiring. up. If you mash up like, you know, the best shit out there and you get to, you know, that's that's a sign of a great artist is mashing up just the coolest shit from all different walks of life. Well, I, I, I kind of like that thread that we did with the film Taxi Driver uh, in, in that we did address things like the Assassin's Diary and the Searchers, like a lot of the elements that informed me. You know, we didn't talk about, and I'm not going to because we'd be cheating, but I wanted to really get into how weirdly Schrader was inspired to write Taxi Driver with his um, alienation, ennui, and anomie in Los Angeles. <laughs> he was a taxi driver in Los Angeles. I'm, I'm not trying to talk about it because we screwed up and it's, we're hey. over. But no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm just saying like... Um, but you do, uh, you, do, you do see that in interviews with him. He does talk about it, you know? So I think yeah. we made a lot well, of space I, I Continued our, reading. Continued reading. Continued reading. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but let's but talk about, about next week. week. Next week. Okay, we're so doing next Frozen. Week. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus wanted us to do Frozen. So. No, we're doing... We're doing uh, Jay and well, Silent Bob Strike Back. Um, okay. Oh, oh shit. God. Naga oh, Nooch. Naga no. We're all going to wear um, hockey jerseys. Oh, right? God. Shit. And like backwards baseball hat. Backwards cast. baseball hat. Oh. oh. But, 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 the, but, the, but the hockey uh, jersey <laughs> oh, wait, still he's huge. already got one. <laughs> but you, oh, yeah, you're all set. You're halfway there. No, but like the, the hockey jersey is still enormous and triple X L. Yeah, because he used to be fat, but like we're, we're all thin, so it's gonna wear really weird. Because <laughs> he has this new look of <laughs> yeah, like the thin post heart attack guy, but with still enormous baby clothing. Yeah, he still has this. He didn't change the wardrobe. So <laughs> yeah, awful. I yeah, know exactly. Is. Okay, his we're shorts not. Shorts go down to like his calves. They're like a stovepipe of shorts that go down to the the calf. Okay, You're right. It looks on. like a bait, like a toddler, toddler. <laughs> Full-size toddler. Absolutely. <laughs> this is going Absolutely. off the rails. Okay, we are we not can do doing it. We're off the clock. We're, we're off the clock. But we're it's not doing taxi it. taxi driver, man. It's... <laughs> no, but no, he's just saying, like, uh, we're not this doing is repulsive. We're not I, I doing see everyone's. I see everyone clicking stop. Yeah, I know. Right exactly. Now. Okay, what um, movie are we doing next week? Okay, we're going to continue the themes and threads of urban uh, nihilism, I guess, if you will. Um, New York City nihilism. <laughs> New York City nihilism. <laughs> And uh, we are going to focus, Marcus. Kind of focus, focus. I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, focus on what we're saying. Happen, guys. <laughs> There's a joke yeah. there. That's that's a great joke. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. Marcus, I really need you to focus. Right <laughs> and uh, the, uh, that made to, me laugh. Go ahead. To, to our Spotify <laughs> listeners, Marcus' camera went out of focus. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. He went out of his camera's out of focus. Yeah, we are going to be continuing the traditions of that, looking at another New York City piece of misanthropic horror uh, with oh, the 1980, brutal. right? Yeah, 1980, Tom. Yes. Oh, yeah. Brutal serial killer scuzz fest that is God. Maniac. So Bill Lustig's Maniac. Look at <laughs> A true... Yay. Well, you know what it is? Just, just uh, for me, the bumper sticker of this is... It's one of those rare horror films that really is horrifying. Yeah. Like I kind of hate comic booky. Not, no offense. Like comic booky, cartoony horror. Like uh, yes. te a Texas Chainsaw Two. Like I want like a horror movie to be horrific, and this film is. Yeah. Absolutely. It's big and it's like dreamlike, but it's absolutely relentlessly suffocatingly horrible. And yes. I, you know, I just 
you know, and, and, and it still is. You know, still it's is. like 40 years old. Didn't so, yeah. Okay. Um, he made a really uh, a heavy movie with, um, and, and, you know, it's not unlike Taxi Driver in a few ways. It has um, a, a few parents, like it has an inspired director, but it also has an incredibly inspired lead performance. Yes. You know, yes. in, yep. in uh, Joe Spinell, who's yep. in Taxi Driver. <laughs> exactly. Know? So there's a little You're loose thread there. trying to bust my chops. Yeah, there's a couple of nice threads there. Uh, so, <laughs> Maniac, I'm 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 a, I'm super excited to talk about this movie. I love this movie. It's insane on many levels. It's insane. Um, it's not meant for it really a lot is. Of people. Uh, so it's not fun. Trigger yeah. warning. Uh, yeah. Up and down. Yeah, for sure. So, all right, everybody, that'll be next week. One fucking hour on Maniac. Uh, excited about that. And without further ado. We can't let you leave uh, without your moment of zen. <laughs> All right, I love everybody. how that's. It just right. cuts through the air. All right, <laughs> peace. All right, bye everybody and Naganooch. Oh wait, 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 wait! Pull the tag. Naganooch. Time for a fatty boom, fatty blunt. Time for a fatty boom, fatty blunt. Moment. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. Mm-hmm.